All right. So the last class we were discussing about Leuenberger observer, which is like a fixed gain observer, which attempts to reconstruct the states and tries to drive the error between the estimated state value and the actual state value to zero by the choice of our gain K matrix such that the poles are in the left half plane. But notice, remember that uh, when we designed the Leuenberger observer, we assumed that the dynamics of the system were known or they were kind of uh, deterministic in nature, which means we did not take into account the effect of noise in the system. So now we are going to relax that and take that into account as well. And then we try to figure out what is the value of K which helps us satisfy these states estimation to be done properly. And what you end up with getting is a carbon filter. Okay. Now, ideally carbon filter can be shown as a solution of an optimization problem, which can be set up. And then you're trying to solve for the, um, try to minimize your objective function. And then the output is a basically a carbon gain that you get the K matrix. But for our purposes, we will not go into this proof of this optimization or setting up of the optimization problem, but rather we will try to take a look at what exactly is happening in the filter. What are the steps which the filter goes through? How does the process actually implement it? How is the implementation step actually done? We will talk about Kalman filters, then we will talk about extended Kalman filters, which is like an extension of Kalman filters to apply to nonlinear systems. So Kalman filter typically is applicable only for linear systems or linear state space models, especially time invariant and time varying system, linear time invariant and linear time varying systems. And you will see that we will mostly focus on the discrete time version of it. The reason being that most of the time when we are looking at measurements, we are not looking at continuous analog measurements in most of the cases. We are looking at digital measurements nowadays, which always generally comes in discrete time steps. So it makes sense to talk about discrete time steps. So we won't focus much on uh, what the dynamics looks like for continuous time common filters. For practical implementation, it is the discrete time version, which will be more useful for us. Okay, so first things first, Kalman filter is a recursive filter and basically it estimates the states of a linear or a non-linear dynamic systems from a series of noisy measurements, which means that we are seeing some measurements come in in the form of either GNSS satellite measurements or IMU measurements or LIDAR measurements. And based on these states, based on these measurements, the system is trying to reconstruct the state of the vehicle as to where is it, what is its velocities, what is its accelerations, what is its angular velocities, what is its orientation. All of that you want to figure out from your sensor information. The idea of it being called a filter is a little bit uh, oxymoronic because the main idea of Kalman filter is to fuse multiple measurements to get you what the state vector is. But nevertheless, you can also do some filtering, which means that it can remove the noise from the state estimates and tries to give you the best possible output of the state estimates. Or the, it, it's trying to optimize it in such a way that it gives you the best possible estimate of the state at any particular time. Now, the Kalman filter can also be used for prediction purposes, which means that when you have a loss of information from the sensors, in the sense, let's say your satellite signals are not coming in or your IMU experiences a failure, then you can continue to use your model to predict further as to what will happen. And that seems to go on well until you get new measurements. So it's not just a filter which is taking in measurements and purely relying on that. In case if measurements are not available for a small period of time, you can even use it to predict the dynamics as to how it is going forward. So it, is, it gives you a way to uh, predict into the future when you don't know any measurements coming in from your sensors. As and when new measurements do come in, the filter prediction is then corrected and then updated in order to give the minimum variance estimate. So that is the main aspect that you want to minimize the variance of the estimate. So it's trying to see the state vector 
whose covariance matrix has least diagonal terms so that the variance is as small as possible. That's what it's trying to predict. Okay, one of the key assumptions which is very important to understand is that this is applicable primarily for observable systems. You need to make sure that the system is observable, only then the Kalman filter can do its job. If the system is not observable, then you cannot predict the states of something which is not observable. Okay. And you have to make sure that that is very much needed. And if you look back in the math behind the Kalman filter, this condition is particularly necessary to prove convergence. Otherwise, the filter will not necessarily converge. All right, so let's take a look at uh, what that discrete time Kalman filter looks like. So suppose I have a continuous time, linear time varying system, as you see here. So x dot is equal to a times x plus b times u plus e times w, where a, b, and u are all having a time dependence on them, which means that they are varying with time as we progress further. Similarly, the output of the system is given by C matrix times X plus B matrix times U plus a measurement noise epsilon. Again, you see here the time dependence is there, which is why the system is time varying system. W here denotes a zero mean Gaussian process. Uh, notice that it is zero mean. Okay? We always want to ensure that the mean of the process is actually zero. Similarly, the measurement noise is also a zero mean Gaussian noise. Now, as I said, we are interested in the so-called discrete time version of the system because it is the discrete time version that we will generally be applying. So if we wanted to discretize it, we can discretize the system as you see here, where X at time step K plus one is given by some matrix AD, which is different from A. So AD is not necessarily equal to A. Okay? AD times X of K plus BD times U of K plus ED times W of K. So you kind of see the process being similar to what was before, except that these matrices are discrete versions of the continuous matrices. And we'll see how to get these discrete time versions. Now, it can be shown that if, especially if the system is linear time invariant, then the discretized matrices are constant, which means they do not vary with time. And they can be shown as AD is given by phi, where phi is the matrix which is computed as you see here. Okay, or in, in other words, it is nothing but a matrix exponential of a times h. Okay. This is not the same as each term taken as an exponent of e to the power of that. That's not what this means. This means that the definition is given as the Taylor series which you see on the right hand side. Notice that this doesn't mean that I take every term in the matrix and just do e to the power of that. That's not the same as this. Okay. This is called a matrix exponential. All right, so this P is what you have instead of uh, A when you are looking at the discrete time version. B is given by A inverse times P minus the identity matrix. Multiplied by the B matrix. C remains to be C and B remains to be D. E is again, ED is again given by A inverse times phi minus I times E. So that's what you see here. Later, later. I'm in the class right now. Okay. All right. So this becomes your discrete time matrices, which now looks at the discretized version of the system. So we were looking at the previously time continuous system. If we want to construct a discrete time system out of it, it is these matrices that we need to worry about. Okay, 
notice that when we have an Euler integration, when we are basically saying that the x dot can be given as x of k plus 1 minus x of k divided by h, I am simply replacing that A matrix, the discrete matrix, as the first two terms of this P matrix. Okay, but the more general term, the more uh, the correct version is to include this value of phi as my A. But for most for practical purposes, many a times you will see that we'll try to approximate this matrix equation and only consider the first two terms or the first three terms in order to get the value of this discretized value of this A matrix. So notice that since we moved from the matrix A, B, C, and D to A, D, B, D, C, D, and D, D, uh, these matrices need not have the same stability characteristics as before, which means its eigenvalues now will be at a different location. So it is possible that the original system may have been stable, but the discretized system may not be stable or vice versa, or both may be unstable or both may be stable. So it becomes important to understand that when we are trying to deal with this process, the discrete time version of the system actually is observable in order for us to go ahead with the filtering process. So even though the continuous time version may be observable, we do want to show that the discrete time version of it is observable before we can progress with carbon filters. And in some applications, it might be critical because it may so happen that the continuous time system is observable, but the discrete version may, may not be observable. So you have to verify that before you proceed with it. For most of our applications, more or less we will see that it is observable for most purposes, okay? unless until we are looking at some special cases. Okay, so let us look at what are the steps in the Kalman filter. So rather than go through the equations, first I'll cover this flow chart and then I'll come back to what are the equations for each of the step. So in a flow chart sense, what is happening in the Kalman filter is we initialize some value of the estimated state at time zero. Okay? And we also specify some covariance matrix at time zero. Once we have these, we are using the Carlton gain, which is going to give me the value of that K matrix, which we have seen before, in order to determine what will be the new state vector. Okay. So that is the updated state vector and its covariance. So first step will be, I start off at some initial point and I'm taking that step forward and predicting what should be the, or what should be the, based on the measurement, what is the updated value of the state I'm trying to figure out. So notice that here I'm getting an input basically from the measurements. This measurements is coming in. Okay. In fact, this is a slightly misnomer. This point should be here after I've corrected. After I correct, I get X hat of Okay. So we compute the Kalman gain. Once we know the Kalman gain, we update the new states in order to get the new state vector x hat. So we are basically doing a correction to our state vector at the same time step. Okay. This is not changing this time step. So if I started at a k equal to 0, I'm correcting that value at k equal to 0 based on the measurement at time t equal to 0. So far, everybody with me? Okay. Now, at the next time step, I'm correcting the covariance matrix. So what is the new uncertainty on my state vector that I predicted? This fellow's uncertainty. Based on the measurements I got, I'm updating my covariance matrix. So that is called as the corrector step. So you start with some value of the original state, take a measurement at that time, and try to update what is the new state value. That is called the corrector step. Once I do the corrector step, I also make a prediction step, which means going forward from k, what is the value possibly I might get at k plus one. Okay, so this is going to 
next one, which is predictor step, that is going to give me so-called output here will be the estimated value of the state at k plus 1, which then I feed it back into the system. Okay, So the starting point now becomes k plus 1 at step. It will correct for it based on the measurement at time k plus 1, whatever we observe, and then make a prediction for what will happen at time k plus 2. And this keeps on going forward in loop. So as long as I have a provided initial condition, I can basically keep integrating forward based on whatever inputs which are coming in, which are in the form of measurements from the system. Everybody at least is following what is going on roughly in the loop. Um, sir, can you uh, explain once again what is the role of the covariance factor? Ah. Basically, you see, in the Kalman filter, we are not just bothered about what is the state vector itself, but we also want to see what is the uncertainty associated with it. Because we have these noises which are coming into the system, we want to know what is the uncertainty associated with it. And that uncertainty is denoted in terms of a covariance matrix. So let us say that the state vector is a n cross 1 vector then I will have a corresponding covariance matrix, which I'm denoting as E, and that will be estimated at time T as well. And this will be N cross N vector. Okay. Where I'm not only looking at the variance between one mode to the itself, but I'm also looking at one mode to the other. So that's why you have a full matrix which comes into the picture. Okay. And that is where we want to kind of take the value of these noises which are coming into the system and still find the best estimate of X such that its covariance is as minimal as possible. The lower the covariance, the more accurate my estimates are. So the target of the filter is to drive this value of P to be as small as possible. Okay, that is the main idea behind it. Everybody with me so far? All right. Okay. All right. So now we will come back to each of these steps. So when I say the initial value I want to specify, I start off at some state, right? And I say that this is my original state where I start off. But I may not know precisely where I am. I may have some uncertainty associated even with my initial state. There is no guarantee that I know precisely where I am when I begin. Right? For example, let's say we have our craft and we are trying to look at our GPS data and figure out where initially we are. Right? Even then, the GPS has its own uncertainty associated with it. So we don't precisely know where we are. We know that we are there in some cone of uncertainty. And that so-called cone of uncertainty, that radius of uncertainty inside which we are there, that wall of uncertainty, is denoted by this covariance matrix, which we are specifying as P0, which is nothing but expected value of x minus x hat times x minus x hat transpose. Okay, notice here we do not know x. In reality, we don't know x. We are building our filter in order to estimate x. Right? But some estimate of it we know that what is the value of this covariance matrix we are specifying to begin with. Okay, I'm uncertain about it by so and so much. Okay, and then I let the filter start its job. So the value of k which we need it can be shown that if I compute the value of k in this particular manner using this particular equation which you are seeing here, then that will give me the best estimate of x such that the variance is minimized. By solving that so-called optimization problem, we are determining these equations for the value of k. Remember in the Leuenberger observer, we chose the value of k based on where I want to put my ports. Here what I am saying is I am not choosing the value of k in that manner, but rather I am trying to solve for an optimization problem 
where I want not only my errors to go to zero, but I also want my covariances to be as minimal as possible. And solid solution of that optimization problem is giving me this value of k. Okay, so this k is basically called the Kalman gain. And let's see what is there in it. So I take the previous, the times previous estimate of the covariance matrix, multiply it by CD transpose, which is the output matrix, times this matrix inverse. Okay, where you're seeing that CD times PK times CD transpose plus RDK, whole things inverse. Now you realize that this is actually the measurement noise. This is the measurement noise covariance matrix. So for example, let us say I have a IMU on board the vessel and when the vessel is about to start, I keep the heading constant, I just hold the vessel in place and I make a set of observations as to what the value of psi I am reading from the IM. I take a value of over a certain period of time and simply find out what is my standard deviation of that value. That will determine basically what is this noise which I am experiencing because the fixed value is a fixed value. I know that my psi is not changing with time. but my measurement is oscillating a little bit here and there. So what is that noise which is coming into the filter? So these are noises on account of measurements. So sensor noise is what we are talking about here. Everybody with me so far? So RD basically here represents the sensor noise. For most practical purposes, you'll see that these matrices will be specified as diagonal matrices. You, you won't generally be able to predict the cross matrices very effectively all the time. So for most practical purposes, when we are actually implementing it in field, we would want to at least know the diagonal matrices properly. Everybody with me so far? Any confusions? Something wants to be explained again? Let me know now. Sir. Yes, Aditya. Sir, this measurement noise, how do we know it exactly? Because it, it's a random. It, it right. You can measure it, right? That's what I'm saying. Let us say we hold the ship in a particular way. So let us say you put it on your cart and take it out. Okay. And you leave it be on the cart. Now you collect the data about your heading angle. Okay. Okay. After a certain period of time, you will see that when you take the heading angle, it will not be a flat line. It will have some undulations on it. Yes. That undulations is what is basically your noise. Correct? Yes. I can take the standard deviation of that signal and that will give me a good estimate of how much is the variance of the process. Okay. Okay. Similarly, suppose I take my vessel, put it in the open field and I just leave it there and collect the GPS information for a certain time. Okay, I will know what is the uncertainty in X and Y directions based on the latitude and longitudes which I get from it. Yes. Okay. So that is how we will get a estimate of this sensor noise generally by doing some measurements against a fixed value. Okay. In some cases, the uh, the manufacturer of the sensor may provide you with data which denotes how well or how bad the system measurement looks like. Yes. So sometimes you will see sensors, the role which we can offer is plus minus 0 0.05 degrees, which means they are saying that in within certain band of confidence, it will be between plus or minus 0 0.05 degrees. You can imagine that to be like a standard deviation and go ahead with the process. Okay. So it, it, the smaller the value of this matrix, it denotes more precise your measurements are. OK, 
okay not accurate it's saying it is more precise which means every other observation is as close to it as possible they all may be showing something wrong that is possible but they are at least very precise that's what it means and every term in this uh, matrix the diagonal term it corresponds to one particular sensor is it like that it will correspond to no not necessarily to one particular sensor it will correspond to one particular output state that you are measuring of the sensor yes so for example let's say you have an imu an imu will affect six of these states it will measure the three accelerations and the three angular velocities whereas if it's a gps it will measure only two states x and y okay. so the covariance will only be limited to those aspects it's only a part of the state vector which you are actually measuring sometimes it may not even be a state in itself it may be something combined which we may be measuring so for example if you look back remember when we try to do this filtering process we what we are measuring is com combination of wave induced and low frequency induced your angle but that's not a part of our state our state actually has the wave part and the low frequency part separately so we may not always be measuring something which is exactly there in the state vector also we may be measuring something different also so our target is to use that measurement and then still be able to compute what is the best estimate of our state that is the idea okay all right so once we have this so called kalman gain k so notice that the only difference is compared to the leuenberger observer and here is that the kalman gain is given by this equation there you were able to choose the value of k based on pole placement method okay here we are choosing the value of k based on this optimization problem so once we have this k you will see that what you are seeing in the output is similar to what you saw in the leuenberger observer which means the corrected value of the state is the previous value of the state plus k times the difference in the output where y is the actual measurement and this part represents the value of the measurement if x hat was my state this part i can also represent it as y tag y y hat as well right i would not be wrong in saying that this is nothing but y hat minus so i am taking a difference between y and y hat minus and multiplying that by some value of gain and then adding up to my previous estimate of the state to get my new state that is what we had in the leuenberger observer as well so no different only difference is the value of k is different okay so where in that case we were not bothered about what happens to the noises how do noises are taken into account was not taken into account here we are considering those matrices that is why you will see that our gain matrix actually does depend on the measurement covariance matrix how much uncertainty there is there on the measurement does affect on the gain value which i am having so it does affect how much my estimate is being corrected is that making sense this was not there previously the leuenberger observer did not have the covariance matrix of the noise affecting your current states because it was based on a deterministic proposition but here we are taking into account the fact that if the noise covariance matrix is so and so much how should i tune my gain to get the best estimate of the state everybody with me so far okay now once i have the state estimation done i also need to estimate what is the uncertainty on that state right so this is the state which the corrected state which i have got but what is the covariance matrix of that so that i know how precise are my corrected values and you will see here that again this depends on the previous estimates covariance matrix and the measurements covariance matrix it's as if i am taking into account what was the uncertainty before and i am taking into account what was the uncertainty in the measurement to compute my new uncertainty in the latest measurement which i get okay 
I am not talking still very clearly about how these equations have come up. Okay. As I said, we will not be discussing that optimization problem and solution here. Just understand intuitively as to what is happening. It is taking in the previous steps covariance matrix, doing some algebraic manipulation with it and adding it to something which is depending on the measurement covariance noise. So both of these are contributing to your new covariance matrix. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Now, once that corrector step is done, which means that whatever was my previous predicted value, I have corrected it based on my observations which I got. The observations are coming from my measurements. So my measurements change and this also is coming from measurements. change what is my new value of the state variable. Once I do this, I will do the correct predictor step where I want to go forward in time and predict what will happen at the next time step. Okay, so I'm looking at x hat minus at time k plus one. So I'm going forward in one time using this best estimate of state that I have. Okay. In a similar way, I will basically uh, calculate the covariance matrix of the next best estimate of the state based on the previous time covariance and the process noise. So this noise is the noise which is coming into the process of the system. You can think of it as uncertainties. Let us say if we are looking at our craft, uncertainties in the ocean, uncertainties in the wind, wave and currents which are causing us to oscillate a little bit. How those effects are coming into the picture. High frequency oscillations, the noise component of that is what we are denoting here by process noise. In general, it is very hard to find out what this process noise is. You don't know it ahead of time. Okay, but you generally try to tune your gains. So basically you don't tune the value of K, but you try to tune the value of this Q in order to see that whether your filter is performing well or not. So when you're trying to tune, design your filter, it is this Q value that you're tuning a little bit and trying to figure out whether my states are coming to be what I expect them to be or not. All right, so once I have the corrector step done, again, this will go back and feed back into the corrector step. Sorry, once I have the predictor step done, these values, which are predicted values, will now be updated based on the measurements which come at time k plus one. Okay, and those will be again formal, uh, taken forward by the next predictor to get me the values at time k plus two and so on and so forth. So this keeps running until I say stop. So that is what is happening inside the um, filter. Okay. And I've been a little hand wavy about the equations because we do not want to go into the math of it right now. For our purposes, we want to have an intuitive understanding of how that value of these filters are coming in. I'm not really interested in starting out the optimization problem description and how we actually got these equations out. Okay. If you are really interested in that, you can refer to some standard textbooks on carbon filters on navigation systems, which will have this information very well documented. Even Kalman's paper is also a good source, 1960 Kalman and Busey filter. Uh, that paper has the required details for this. But for most of our practical application purposes, this information should suffice more or less. Okay, as I said, QD here represents process noise covariance matrix, RD here represents measurement noise covariance matrix. 
x hat minus and p hat minus they denote the a priori state and covariance matrix estimates so these are the names which are given which means this is before the update what is their value after the prediction and after the update what is their value is given by these quantities okay so in general this is again the kalman filter loop which you see where it is taking an initialization, computes the Kalman gain, runs the state corrector, covariance corrector, then the predictor, feeds it back in order to compute the new gain, new state corrected value, new covariance corrected value, and the next prediction, and so on and so forth. So what we are reading out of the filter is this fellow. The state estimate is what we are of interest to us, which we take it out and then use it as an input for our control system. So if you want to develop a controller, this state vector is what we are providing it as an input. Okay. As long as the system is observable and it is a linear time invariant system, it can be shown that this Kalman filter will converge. Just give me one second. All right, so the idea then becomes that we are measuring these state estimates and we are getting them out. So as long as we are looking at a linear time invariant system, who, which is observable in nature, you can show that this algorithm will actually converge and X hat will start approximately being tracking your X value, which is your actual estimate behind it. And this was a very powerful result when Kalman and you see, came up with this in the 1960s because it not only takes into account just your pole placement deterministic dynamics, but you're able to actually tune your gain or modify your gain based on the noise which is coming into the system. So it kind of gave you an added level of control which was not possible previously. Okay? That was the main power of this. And it could account for measurements having different covariance matrices. So the filter can deal with the idea that some measurements may be more precise, some measurements may be less precise. So for example, it is possible that your GPS measurements may be less precise, whereas your IMU measurements may be more precise. So which one to believe more? The filter can automatically take that into account based because it is taking the covariance matrices into the account. So based on what is the measurement noise covariance matrix, it will determine what is the best estimate of the state, given the fact that the uncertainty on the measurements of different sensors is different. Is that making sense? Yes, no. And it was a very powerful result, you see, because which measurements to trust more and which measurements to trust less is intrinsically taken care of and you don't have to worry about it as long as you can provide the uncertainty amounts quantified to it and provided to the filter. Okay, so, but this had a limitation that it could only be applied to the so-called linear time invariant systems, right? Where we are looking at a state space which is in the matrix form, x dot is equal to a times x plus b times u and y is equal to c times x plus d times u. But if we wanted to extend this further and look at a non-linear system and apply it there as well, then we come up with this idea of what is called as extended Kalman filter. Now, there is also a different version of this non-linear extension, which is called unscented Kalman filter, and we'll not be covering that in this particular course. But extended Kalman filter has found a tremendous amount of application in many, many, many navigation-based applications. So it's worthwhile to take a look as to how, how we can apply the Kalman filter algorithm to nonlinear systems. So when I say nonlinear systems, our system is no longer x dot is equal to a times x plus b times u. This was a linear system. This was linear. But here there can be some arbitrary function of x, u, and the noise y, w. Okay, so x dot is given by some nonlinear function 
of the state variables, control inputs, and the process noise W. And your output also, the measurement what you are making, need not be a linear function of the states, but rather may be some nonlinear function of the state variables and the control inputs. So depending on what is the state variable and the control inputs, my value of Y may be non-linearly dependent on them. And but we are adding some noise, which is called the measurement noise. All right, so you can see that the extension here is F and H are now non-linear vector fields. And the process is very similar again. So let me first go back here and show you what happens. And then we'll come back to this idea. We'll still apply the Kalman filter algorithm, but the only difference is that we'll now define these discretized matrices AD, BD, CD, and DD in terms of the nonlinear vector fields. Okay, so if I want to find out what my value of AD is, that is identity plus H times A matrix. That's what you had seen before. So instead of that A matrix, we are basically replacing that with a Jacobian of the nonlinear vector field. So we are taking a derivative of that vector field with respect to our state vector, which will be a matrix in itself again. So that matrix evaluated at that current state in a Taylor series expansion we are using that matrix as the value of A when we are trying to figure out what AD looks like. Okay. Everybody with me on this? It's a simple fact that I'm taking a Taylor series expansion of F with respect to its state variables and simply taking the first term of it and keeping it. That's all. The same is applicable, you will see, for your ED matrix as well, where again you are taking a derivative of F with respect to X. And it is also applicable for your CD matrix where you are taking a derivative of H with respect to X, which is the nonlinear measurement function. Okay. So all we are doing is trying to compute what is the value of this derivative at the point where the X is actually given by my best estimate X factor. Okay. Especially when we are looking at the extended Kalman filter, you will also notice that we are also making sure that the noise is zero when we are calculating this derivative. So when I'm taking the derivative of that plant, I'm evaluating at when the noise is equal to zero. Okay, because this function, this function f is a function of all three quantities. Correct? But I'm evaluating it when x is equal to x hat, which is the value that I know about it, and w is equal to 0. Everybody with me so far? <coughs> if there is any question, something wants to be explained again, let me know now so that we can cover it before I go to the next step. How do we know the W is zero? How do I know? W, the noise is zero. Oh no, I do not know that the noise is zero. I'm evaluating this derivative at the point where I presume the W is zero. I'm not saying that the W is actually equal to zero. Mm -hmm. I evaluate this value of AD that I'm trying to calculate and I'm trying to calculate the value of AD, right? Mm -hmm. yes. I say that I am evaluating that derivative at W equal to 0. Okay. That's all. I am not saying necessarily that the noise vector itself will be equal to 0. It is as if it's a Taylor expansion, right? Mm -hmm. So evaluated at 0 multiplied by whatever is the value of the noise because it is a zero mean Gaussian process. Mm -hmm. okay. that, that is what is coming back into the picture. The mm. mean value of the state vector is x hat, but the mean value of the noise is 0. Mm. So when I take a derivative and evaluate it at the equilibrium point, that equilibrium point will be when the state is equal to the best estimate of my state and the noise is 0. 
that is why we chose that zero mean gaussian process hmm. everybody with me so far ha uh, what do you give to you one by one yeah yes go ahead well uh, the value of the control inputs what do we take for this calculation of ad we exactly know what the value of u is right because that is a oh, control yeah. which we are providing so at yeah. that input itself we will figure out there is no uncertainty in u because u you exactly know hmm. joel you had a question um uh, sir regarding the uh, original kalman filter we had the pro- uh, assumption that the system should be observable right Mm. But um, in this case, um, it, because it's a non-linear system, how do we know that it's observable? We can't verify that, right? From... You can. I mean, I mean, once you get these uh, AD and CD and BD matrices out, you can still try to see whether it is observable. Use those. Okay, we use those matrices. Right? Yes, but then the problem still persists that it may be not observable from time to time. It's possible. Uh, okay. and Absolutely. even if it is observable it may be very weakly observable in some instances okay. yeah, so true. yes you are right that the so called optimality which was there in the kalman filter where it was trying to find the optimal gain which would try to get me the best estimate of x does suffer a little bit when it comes to extended kalman filters so we do lose the fact that it may no longer be the optimal point because you are linearizing about a certain point and then doing the predictions so you may not be precise and that is definitely there if the system's dynamics is really such that it may so happen that the kalman filter may digress it may diverge it is possible so that convergence being definitely possible in the kalman filter fact is definitely lost by the time we come to extended kalman filters so you do lose that okay so once i have these matrices i am going back and doing the same steps again so i prescribe some initial values for my state and my covariance matrix then i start computing my kalman gain and you'll see that this kalman gain has the same structure as before absolutely no difference only now that those discretized matrices now are coming from your jacobian of your nonlinear vector fields rather than coming from the original system being linear then you do the same thing with the state correction and you see that it's exactly the same only a difference you will see here that this fellow previously we had this as y hat minus of k was given by cd times x hat plus dd times u something like this right but now i don't use that value not the discretized value but i use the exact value of h here that making sense let me go back and show you that in the kalman filter this is what we had as this y hat minus right but here i can actually go ahead since it's a nonlinear system and if i know what the measurement looks like i am not going to take it to be equal to this so no longer equal to this but i simply use the nonlinear version of it in order to evaluate what is the possible measurement so this is saying this is basically giving me what would have been the output had my state been x hat minus and my control input would have been u what is the possible output which i would have got so instead of using that from the discretized version i can actually get the actual value from it okay that is one major difference you will see similarly you will also see that in the predictor step also you will see the difference but before i get there the covariance character step is exactly the same as what you saw before same as before there is no difference okay again in the state predictor step you remember that here again we had this so called 
value which was coming from the fact that I was trying to progress it forward in time using the linear dynamics. Here I can make it for progress forward with the nonlinear dynamics in order to get what is my new state vector. Okay. But notice one important difference. In the predictor step, I assume the noise is zero. Okay. I presume that the noise is zero and then I predict it forward. And then whatever error has come in, I'll try to correct for it in the corrector step based on my measurements. So the measurement step still continues the same. The predictor and the corrector steps are still following the same process as what you saw in Kalman filter, but you are basically extending it to nonlinear systems through linearization. Okay, so these matrices which you have evaluated, AD, BD, and ED, and CD, they're all coming from linearization. And because of those linearization, you do lose something. So remember that when we had the Kalman filter, it was an optimal estimator for the linear system, which means that stability was guaranteed, convergence was guaranteed. But when I use the extended Kalman filter, the linearization leads to a loss of optimality. The solution which I get need not be the optimal solution anymore. Okay, it may not be the best estimate of the state. It is some estimate of the state, but it need not be the best estimate. I can't prove that it is the optimum. Now, especially if the initial state is wrong and the process is not modeled correctly in your filter, it is possible that you may see your system may diverge in this case. Okay. Whereas the stability and convergence were guaranteed in the linear case, those are no longer guaranteed when you are coming to the extended Kalman filter case. So you win some, but you lose some. You win the idea that you can now apply this to nonlinear plants, but you lose the idea that the solution may no longer be optimal. All right. Okay, and one of the downsides of EKF is that the estimated covariance matrix which we get from this methodology tends to be underestimated than the true covariance matrix for many systems. Which means we are saying that the measurements are very precise, but in reality they are not. Or the estimates are as precise as we believe, but they are in reality probably they have a bigger uncertainty than what we believe. And that can be dangerous. The other way around is fine. I may believe it to be less uncertain, but the actual measurement may be more, the actual state which I get may be more precise. I can get away with that. That is good for me. But this is not good for me. Because the actual covariance of this value, the optimality or the so-called optimal, if you were to look at, may have a bigger covariance than what I'm predicting it out. Okay. So you have to take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt. However, even despite these uh, disadvantages with it, it has evolved as the de facto standard in inertial navigation systems. You will see that it is being applied in most INS systems, which means inertial navigation systems, uh, IMUs for giving you the orientations. This is what is going on behind the scenes. Okay. So it has emerged as a de facto standard because it seems to be doing quite well as long as we are not diverging too much from the nonlinear plants. Okay. I had a yes. Tell me. So uh, basically, for nonlinear systems, we are linearizing and using the Kalman. Correct. Correct. We are essentially exactly doing that. We are linearizing the system about the operating point and then using it. So what problem will arise due to the linearization? Your solution may no longer be optimal. Okay. The estimate which you are getting need not necessarily converge, need not necessarily be stable. You can't prove mathematically that it will be stable. Whereas with the linear case, you could prove mathematically that by applying, applying the Kalman filters algorithm, the state will always converge and it will always be stable. That, so, uh, 
So are we using feedback linearization or different shit? No, that, that part comes next. No, we are not using feedback linearization here. We are using simple linearization about the operating point. That's all. We are not doing feedback linearization. That's a separate topic altogether. Yes, sir. Okay. There the idea is slightly different that you want to convert it into a plant such that it behaves like a linear plant. But that's not what we are doing here. This linearization is purely about one particular point. You, if you look back, we are evaluating these matrices at the instantaneous value of x of k. As x of k changes, these matrices will change. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that completes our discussion about Kalman filters and extended Kalman filters. We'll try to take a look at an example of where we try to apply this to heading autopilots and dynamic positioning systems, and we'll close off there. But before we go there, you remember that when we talked about in the control system case, whenever we have these angles that we are dealing with, we have to be a little careful about how to take that error between two angles and propagate them forward. Because angles wrap around from minus pi to pi, so you have to take into account that they are not simple real numbers, but they are on a sphere of sorts, or they are on a circle of sorts. So that for that, we had evolved something called the smallest signed angle, where we take a value, a real valued input, and we map it into this domain minus pi to pi. And the idea was that whenever we are looking at the difference between two angles, let's say one angle is zero degrees, the other angle is 355 degrees. The smallest sign angle is actually minus pi degrees, rather than 355 being the difference. If we start using 355, then our controllers may go crazy and we may be seeing a lot of jumps and a lot of funny businesses happening. So it is important that in a practical implementation, we take into account the so-called idea that we are looking at the smallest signed angle. So it maps this unconstrained angle, which is the difference between two angles, to the smallest difference between the angles. And we had seen this example, and I'm just trying to put it back here for refresher purposes, that when we were looking at the PID, PD control using a Nomothos model, uh, we wanted to kind of see that uh, the SSA must be included or the smallest sine angle must be included when we feed it back into the proportional part of the controller. We had seen this before just for refresher purposes. So when I put the control law as a PD control law, you'll see that this is the so-called feed forward process and this is the so-called PID or PD in this case. And I give that back my error dynamics becomes this. Okay, and you have seen this before. It seems from this system that as if that the equilibrium point psi tilde and psi tilde dot being zero and zero is globally exponentially stable, but we have to be careful that it cannot be proven to be pro globally exponentially stable because these values actually map around the circle, not in the real plane. Okay. As long as they map in the real plane, the dynamics is very clear that it will be definitely a, a globally exponentially stable point. But the same can't be said when the angles actually map onto a circle. So that's not the case. So we can't so show that it is mathematically uh, stable when it is defined on this sphere one and not on the real plane. So during a practical implementation, it becomes important to map this fellow to this domain in order to avoid numerical instabilities. And we had looked at the idea that instead of passing psi tilde, we will pass SSA of psi tilde as the proportional part of the controller when we were looking at the control algorithms. So in that case, we can show that the error dynamics is given by this, and this can be shown to be globally exponentially stable. We can show mathematically that this system is globally exponentially stable. So in a similar fashion, when we are doing the state estimation with angles, there also we have to be careful 
that we are taking care of this jump phenomenon coming in. And in order to take care of that, we have to make sure that we are using the SSA in our state estimation process as well. So let's kind of take a quick example just to see where it is coming in. So suppose I took the discrete time nomothos model, you will see that the psi at time k plus 1 can be predicted as psi of time at k plus h times r, where r itself is coming from this so-called nomothos dynamics. I hope this nomothos model is pretty clear, right? There's no need to go over it further. Now, our measurement here in this case would be a y, which is given by the heading angle plus some process, uh, the measurement noise epsilon. So in this case, when we want to do our so-called correction, okay, we want to do our correction based on the observations which we have seen, we have to be careful that psi of k must be equal to psi minus of k plus k1 times, we have to pass the SSA between the two measurements. What is the output which we measure and the what is the expected output from the state which we have estimated that error has to be taken in SSA and then you have to pass it in. So make sure that that SSA is taken into account. Similarly for the Y as well, the R as well. So just to show that this smallest sign angle is quite an important feature when we are looking at practical implementation which needs to be considered. Okay, so the main idea is that whatever this injection term is, y minus y hat, which when they are both angles, we have to make sure that it is mapped onto the unit sphere and then it is mapped back into the feedback system. Okay, something else which I just want to cover before we take up the case study for application of Kalman filters to heading autopilots is when we have asynchronous measurement data. So you know that not all sensors necessarily measure at the same rate. You may have your IMUs measuring at a few hundreds of hertz, whereas your GPS may be at a much lower hertz rate. Right? You may be getting one hertz or two hertz. So it may be different and you need to make sure that the Kalman filter continues to run whenever the updates are not coming in from a particular sensor as well. So how to deal with these so-called asynchronous outputs? The best way to deal with them is to choose the sampling frequency of the filter as equal to the measurement frequency of the fastest measurement. So if the fastest measurement is coming from IMU, you want to choose the sampling frequency of your Kalman filter to be the same as what it is for the coming from the IM. Okay. Now this will mean that at many time steps, the GPS update will not come in. It will come in only every 10 time steps or every 100 time steps only you will see a GPS update coming. So I have to deal with the fact that those sensors are being updated at some smaller rate z, which is given as the ratio of the sampling frequency between the filters frequency versus the measurement frequency of that signal which I want. The practical value, it is practical to try to choose this z to be an integer if possible, so that we don't have to modify our Kalman filter very much. But then sometimes you may be getting asynchronous measurements because even though GPS may say one hertz, it may not be exactly one hertz all the time. I may get measurements come in at in between time steps and I have to deal with them. But as long as the sampling frequency is very, very small enough, I can get away with the fact that I can take it to the nearest time step and assume that the measurement has come at that nearest time step. Okay. And then I can do the filtering process. So the slow measurements will appear every z time step where z is the ratio of the sampling frequencies which you see. And it is important to make sure that whenever you are not seeing an update come up from the GPS, you are not correcting the signal. 
So at the, the, those times when you don't have a measurement at all, in those times you should not do a correction step because correction is only based on the measurement you will do a correction. So you have to modify your Kalman filter slightly so as to make sure that the predicted value is fed into the corrected value when there is no measurement. As and when a measurement comes, you will use that difference between the predicted value and the observed value in order to correct for your new state estimate. So you're basically saying that until I get measurements, I believe my filter dynamics. And when the filter dynamics experiences or gets a measurement from the sensors, I'll try to correct my best estimate to reduce my variance as much as I can. Everybody with me so far? Okay, so with that, we come to an end of what the theory which we wanted to cover. Now we'll try to take a look at two examples of where we try to apply the Kalman filter specifically for a heading autopilot and specifically for a dynamic positioning plan. So we'll try to structure what is these matrix structures which we are getting, the AD, DD, CD and DD matrices. For these two particular problems, how do they look like? Once we get those matrices, the algorithm is pretty straightforward to apply. But how to get those matrices for our problems, we'll try to take a look. So let's first start with the Kalman filter for the heading autopilots. So remember that when we were looking at our heading autopilots, we had our state space model as this, where the states were given by a phi cross one state vector. Where we had the wave induced yaw angle and the low frequency yaw angle. And then there was a bias term, which was basically accounting for all those drift forces, which are coming from ocean waves, currents and wind, low frequency stuff. We had seen this before, this plant. The control input here was the rudder. So it was a scalar value. So I'll represent this curly brackets can be taken off and I can represent it as U in some instances. There were three noise vectors which we had taken into account here and the system state matrices A, B were given as shown here, where the first quadrant, this part, the top corner, represented the second order dynamics of a wave filter, basically some white noise being fed into the filter and output being the yaw angle due to the wave effect. I was modeling it using a second order filter. Right? Everybody remember that? The transfer function for this fellow was kW times s divided by s square plus 2 lambda omega naught s plus omega naught square. Basically, we were feeding a white noise to the system and the output we were assuming that would be somewhere close to the wave frequencies around omega zero. Okay, so we modeled the wave frequency components using the second order filter. The bottom part was nothing but the simple nomothos dynamics, which was PR dot plus R is equal to K delta. That's all it had. Only difference being that we had a bias term in it in order to account for the slowly varying drift forces coming due to the currents and winds. All right, so given this system, whose continuous time derivatives or matrices were given by these, I can discretize those systems in our standard approach. So the A matrix for the discretized system becomes the identity matrix plus H times A. B matrix simply becomes H times B, C matrix is given by C, and D E matrix is given by H times E. As long as I choose these values of these discretized values, I can now formulate a Kalman filter around this process. Okay, the idea will be that it will try to predict my state vector. So best estimate of my state vector will be predicted based on measurements which are coming in in the form of y being equal to psi w plus psi, where this is the noise. This was the system which we were looking at, right? 
and that is why you will see that the C matrix has actually 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So that is why it will be basically adding these two states together. That's what it means. Okay. So as long as now I implement my Kalman filter, I am not only, so previously when we were looking at the example of Leuenberger observer, we were not taking into account the noise there, but here you can take into account the noise and try to get the best estimate of the wave filtered as well as the low frequency your angle, which you can then use as an input for your heading control. This value of psi that you are predicting from the state can be fed back into your controller in order to get the best estimate so that your control loop can get closed. Everybody with me so far? Yes. So whenever we have a ship and we want to implement the Kalman filter for this, we'll need a few parameters. You can see that we need these values of omega zero, lambda, t and k need to be found out in order to formulate my filter and then prescribe my estimates of the heading angles. So how do I find them? T and k we can find them very easily. I can apply some constant rudder angle and see how the turn rate is changing. And from that, I'll get an estimate of the time constants and the value of k. The problematic thing is usually this fellow, omega zero and lambda. I need to measure some amount of motions for over a certain period of time, and then figure out where those FFTs peak lie in order to determine where the wave frequency lies. Once I know where that wave frequency lies, I can specify omega zero to be that equal to that frequency, and then my filter should be on its way. Everybody following me so far? So if you wanted to design a Kalman filter for your actual vessel, this is how we would go about it. You would try to find out T and K, and you would try to find out omega zero. Once you have them, you can formulate these discretized matrices, A, D, B, D, C, D, and D, D. From there, you can now run your Kalman filter algorithm in order to get the best estimates of your psi and psi w. Any questions so far? Yes, no, maybe. Sir? Yes. Sir, how are you calculate omega, calculating omega naught here? Typically, what you do is you will wait in the environment for a while, and let's say you are looking at heave motions. Okay. okay. So, I'm talking about a real ship, it may be for 30 minutes you will collect the information, and after you collect it, you try to plot an FFT of it and see where the peak of that spectrum is like. That will tell you maximum energy is at certain frequencies, so my wave frequency is centered around that. But this omega naught that we estimate from this process what you told now that uh, we can't use it for uh, whole time period we are applying this filter why not because the the excitation is coming from the waves right no matter where the wave frequency is only at that point only the wave will excite the role also right no, but the c state like it, it may not be it may be varying also right so if, if that if the C state is varying, where the direction is varying and the C the waves are varying or the direction is changing, then you can't do the FFT procedure. You'll have to build an observer specifically for estimating what the encounter wave frequency looks like. There are ways to do that as well. We have not covered it in our course, but for a direction changing C also, you can try to predict where the uh, omega zero is coming about. And from there, you'll have to pick the omega zero and put it here. Okay. For most pr practical purposes, the waves won't change that quickly. Yes. Right? Over, over the small period of over a three, four hour duration, you'll typically see the environment usually has a statistical balance. At least for waves, you'll see. Okay. Yeah. Unless until there is some specific reason why that is happening, you'll see that the environment is more or less in, is focused in a particular direction. 
for most of the time. So therefore, you can use your FFT approach in order to compute what is the effective omega zero and use it for your purposes. Okay. Again, SSA implementation is needed to avoid discontinuous terms. So this is something which we have to take care of when we are doing the correction step. That the correction step, the injection term should be mapped to the smallest sign length. So now once we have these different matrices, we can formulate the Kalman filter around them and then use them to predict our estimates of U. Let's try to wrap this up by discussing about the Kalman filters for dynamic positioning systems. Okay. And in the dynamic positioning systems modeling, we saw that the same procedure we had used, the only difference being that now there were three degrees of freedom in which we were seeing these wave effects come into picture, which was in the surge in the X, Y and the yaw angle, all three of them. And we had three separate filters describing the dynamics for each of them. So you had these three different filters, which were characterized in this state space form where your states were six cross one, because each of them was a second order filter. So you'll have an intermediate state for each of those states. We had seen this one before, right? This plan for the dynamics of uh, wave frequencies we had seen before. Now, the output of the system will be three things which we are trying to observe, which is the X, Y in the NED frame and the yaw angle. Those are the three things which we were taking as an output, which was, this is the wave frequency component. This gets added to your low frequency component and that is what you see actually from your compass measurements. Okay, so in essence, if I were to try to put everything together, my state space would look the complete dynamics of the system would look something like this. So we have this wave frequencies following the second order filter dynamics. The eta dot is given by R times V. This is coming from the kinematics of the vessel. We are assuming that the unmodeled dynamics of the system is coming as a random walk process where we are integrating some white noise in order to get an estimate of that. And then our dynamics of the vessel which was coming as mv dot is minus v times v plus some rotation matrix times this bias term plus the x environmental forces which are coming from wind, wave and currents and then the control inputs. Right? This is what we get as the dynamics of the vessel. And the output y which we do measure was nothing but the positions and the orientation, your orientation, coming from the low frequency dynamics plus the component coming from the wave frequency dynamics plus whatever is the measurement noise. So you can see that this plant is quite more complex than, what, than the one which we saw before. So previously we had a five cross one state vector here we can formulate all of this together into a 15 cross one state vector. Okay. And I'll show you how this is 15. So this fellow is six cross one, right? This fellow is three cross one. This fellow is three cross one. This fellow is three cross one. And this fellow is again three cross one. Okay. So we have something is changing here. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is the output. This is part of the output. So your state will basically comprise up till here. So that will give you 15 cross one. Okay. So I can formulate this entire system as a simplified x dot is equal to ax plus bu. And what this a matrix is, we will see that this a matrix is given by this humongous matrix which we now formulate. Okay, so the idea still remains the same. It's only that those matrices now have become much bigger. That's all. But the idea per se of application of Kalman filter has not changed. As long as I know what this matrix A, B and E and C are, I can discretize them just like before. 
using the same approach as before and then formulate the discretized system. Once I know the discretized system, I can apply Kalman filters algorithm in order to estimate the state's form. Everybody with me so far? Yes, no. I'm seeing a little bit of a blankness. What's going on? Did I lose you guys somewhere? Sir, what are the outputs that you were measuring in this system? Ah, in this system, we were measuring all three outputs. We would be measuring the you call put it here. I think. Yeah, so this output also will be a three cross one vector. So which means that you are basically measuring the yaw angle uh, and the positions, x y positions and the yaw angle. Okay, so I'm, I'm presuming here as if that I have a compass which is measuring my yaw angle and I have a GNSS which is giving my X and Y. Okay, so I'm not presuming that I'm measuring all these accelerations and angular velocities from an IMU. I'm presuming that we are dealing with a compass and a GNSS satellite. Okay, you can use the same approach here also where you can get that your angle from your IMU's fused estimates. You can presume that your IMU is trying to give you an estimate of your your angle. Use that for your purposes along with the fused estimates of GMSS. Notice here that this Kalman filters that we have developed here will be rooted in the dynamics of the plant. So they are going to be rooted in the dynamics of the actual plant rather than the Kalman filters, which you're going to see with the ROS. There, the dynamics of the plant is, I, I'm not quite sure whether it is kinematics based or dynamics based. So one has to verify whether when you're using it in ROS, is it using a kinematic model or a dynamic model? Whether it is using your mass matrices, Coriolis matrices, anywhere in the production of these uh, prediction of the future steps, or is it using a kinematics is something I am not quite sure of. To my knowledge, I thought it was kinematics. Yes, sir, it's kinematics only. Kinematics based. Yeah, it's kinematics based. So it only will acceleration will be double integrated to get your position. Not the dynamics of the vessel will not be used in the predictions. So you can make much yeah. more accurate filters by including the dynamics of the data. If if they if it was using dynamics, uh, like we need to specify somewhere the mass metrics and everything, right? We Correct. Need which you do not. That is why my suspicion is that it is using yeah. kinematics. Yes. Okay. So you can actually do much better than them, possibly, if we wanted to. Now that you are armed with the necessary knowledge. But knowledge is one thing and practical is another thing. Hopefully by the end of summer, you guys will have some experience in the practical side of this as well. Okay. All right. So that brings us to an end of the course. So to summarize everything, okay, maybe something which I just missed here was dead reckoning. When we do not have an update from a GPS or a compass, we do the same as what we did before. We trust the model to do its thing and we'll set the Kalman gain equal to zero so that the corrector step will give me the same value as what was coming from the prediction. And as and when a prediction, uh, as and when a output is coming in, you will be then modifying this character step in order to make sure that the correction is happening based on the latest measurements. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this uh, navigation module which we have looked at. So if we look back and take a bird's eye view picture as to what all has happened, then we can say that we started off with discussing the dynamics of the craft what happens and how to model the dynamics of the craft. Almost the first half of the semester was spent on that. And we developed a quite an accurate model of the KCS hull during your assignments. Then we discussed about guidance, navigation and control. So we, we first talked about guidance, which tells us given a certain waypoints, how to map a path between them 
or how to get the desired heading angle for given a set, particular set of waypoints. And that is what we primarily focus a lot on with respect to line of sight guidance algorithms. We try to investigate the stability of these algorithms using Lyapunov methods and demonstrated that uh, the integral line of sight algorithms needs a little modification so that we can use these Lyapunov methods to get a precise control or proof stability for our guidance algorithms. Now, the guidance algorithm gives us a so-called reference signal which we want to track. But the controller needs the actual state of the vehicle so that it can compute the difference between where the guidance algorithm wants you versus where the actual vehicle is in order to do the control of the vehicle. So after guidance, we focused our efforts on the control algorithm side where we focused on pole placement methods, successive loop closures using PID control. We even looked at non-linear and linear PID control with pole placement, which means that we could place the poles of the system at certain locations which we wanted so that the dynamics follows the way that we want it to follow. Then we discussed about the idea of navigation, where we started talking about how to filter out the wave frequency components and the low frequency components away, because the low frequency is what we need in order to feed to us to our controller. So we looked at filtering processes, how the low pass filters, notch filters help us achieve this process. Then we discussed about fixed gain observers in terms of Leuenberger observers, where we are taking into account the deterministic dynamics of the model, but we are not taking into account the stochastic dynamics of the noise. Then finally, we talked about Kalman filters, where the noise is also being taken into account in order to give me the best estimate of the state, which can now be the, the optimal solution for a linear time invariant system. We even extended it it for nonlinear systems in terms of extended carbon filters. And we tried to see some application of that with respect to heading autopilots and for dynamic positioning systems. It's a shame that we probably could not see an assignment on this side of the topic, but hopefully you'll get some more uh, things to try out as we go ahead on your MATLAB grade. So with that, we can stop recording. Are there any other questions which we would like to cover or I'll stop recording. Anything else? So let me stop recording in that case.